Welcome to Good Game, your no BS insights for crypto founders. Do you ever see Uniswap become an order book? Many, many, many years from now, when gas fees go down by by a lot. Yeah, I, mean, I would say I am not religious at all, and have not been for for at least a couple of years now about AMMs and being like, oh, Uniswap is an AMM. I think Uniswap is a DEX, and whatever the best uh, implementation of a DEX for the environment, for the Ethereum environment, uh, and on chain trading and non custodial trading, that's what Uniswap should be. I think that has been an AMM. I think with with Uniswap V3, it's much closer to a um, central limit order book than it was before. And in fact, it's, I, I would say it's about as, Uniswap V3 is about as close to a central limit order book as it is to an AMM uh, that you would describe like Uniswap V2. So I think already we're sort of there. Looking for your next startup idea in crypto? Check out our request for startups list and get inspired at alliance.xyz forward slash ideas. Welcome to Good Game. Today we have two guests that we're going to be speaking with in regards to Uniswap before Uniswap X and um, potentially other products that are, that are coming down the pipeline. And so we have uh, Dan Robinson, who is the head of research at Paradigm. Previously, he uh, co-wrote the uh, Uniswap V2, V3, and V4 white paper. He went to Harvard Law, uh, went to a boot, uh, boot camp uh, that ultimately turned himself into a uh, programmer. And from there, he got into crypto and slowly worked himself into his current role at Paradigm. Evgeny Kovoy, who's the other person that we have on as a speaker, he uh, previously came from uh, the traditional market making space and, tra and traditional finance. So he worked at Optiver, and Optiver turns out, as you know, Chow, is the top three uh, options market maker in the world. I know uh, Optiver very well from my past life in, in, in TradFi. Um, as you guys were competitors, right? We're uh, the most fierce competitors. Uh, in the option space. But Altover is probably also very active in other asset classes, but they're best known for their options market making business. Got it. Yeah. So he then started or co founded Wintermute, which is the, I'd probably say one of the most uh, crypto native market makers in the space. Mm -hmm. uh, they've launched their own protocols. They've been very active in the DeFi space by either trading, providing liquidity, et cetera. So uh, it's a good blend of traditional finance and uh, DeFi. And where Dan comes from is uh, very, very research focused, right? And the idea, and we'll talk more about this, but the idea here is turning Uniswap into a uh, one of the most efficient order books uh, on DeFi rails. And, you know, there's always been this controversy or, you know, topic of choice where we talk about how AMMs aren't really order books. And it's really good to get both of these guys on because obviously... If you think about both of their backgrounds, I think they can offer a lot of insight as to why or why not order books are the, the right model for, for DeFi. Yep. So, uh, so to your point, before Uniswap V4 was um, published or the white paper was published, yep. people speculated that Uniswap V4 was going to look a lot more like an order book than V3, which mm -hmm. already looked very much like an order book compared to the V2. So pe people speculated that over the long term, Uniswap would evolve into uh, something very close to the to the order book, central limit order book. But uh, when I read the V4 white paper, it didn't seem that way. Mm -mm. Um, but at the same time, uh, it feels very early. Uh, I think there's still a lot of work. In, it's still work in progress, and they're still gathering feedback from the community. Mm -hmm. um, but there are two things that stood out for me in the white paper. One was the hooks. Mm -hmm. And um, the other one was the uh, reduction in fees mm -hmm. uh, for deploying uh, strategies. Mm -hmm. um, the hooks enable more flexibility or customizability for market makers. At mm -hmm. least that's what it seems on paper. And the fees, the fee reduction will make it a lot cheaper for market makers to deploy strategies as well. So it seems to me that at a high level, Uniswap V4 is trying to um, target market makers, liquidity providers, rather than uh, market takers, you know, the traders, so to speak. And so that's my understanding of V4. And I'd love to uh, dive deeper with uh, Dan, who obviously co-wrote the white paper. But at the same time, we have Ev Evgeny, which is, I would say, a, a, a user of, uh, of Uniswap. Uh, so I love to get his feedback as a user. I love talking to users of uh, 
existing yeah. products to get a better sense of how the products work. I think it's the most objective way to uh, get a sense of how good the product is. So it'd be really interesting to get a to get both perspectives. Agreed. For me, uh, some you know, outside of the, the the two areas you mentioned with hooks and then uh, and uh, gas fees, which is done through like um, the single tenant flash accounting deployment strategy. I like the idea of uh, some of the examples that they gave of what hooks could enable. And it, to me, it seems like you're absolutely right uh, that they're focused on market makers. But I think in parallel, there's also a bit of a focus on devs that are building this space as well and to attract them to use Uniswap as a way to build certain types of implementations. And you see this already with, with the applications that we're getting in, in within the Alliance, right? Uh, you know, you get so many different types of variations of AMMs. Uh, and to be quite frank, by allowing hooks, you could build these types of implementations using Uniswap and, and the hooks it enables and the liquidity that it offers. So to a certain degree, I, I kind of feel like this is similar to, and I was also surprised, by the way, when I read the Uniswap v4 paper, I thought it was going to be more like an order book model, but it turns out they're going the developer slash, you know, market maker route, which is to enable more market makers to come into space. Uh, it reminds me a lot of the MetaMask snap slash mm. that play yes um which i thought you know metamask was just gonna continue building a a great uh wallet but it turns out they're turning into a more of a developer product where you could enable and run sandbox environments within let's say metamask yep. so it's turning more into a lego and i feel like Uniswap is taking a page out of that book by going that route as well yep um, by the way we've already heard of uh several developers building different features for metamask so I can see the same thing happen on, on Uniswap. The question is, and this is a question we're going to ask Dan, are we going to see billion dollar outcomes out of these hooks, similar to like, you know, what MetaMask may, uh, may co-create with Snap and Zaps, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's yet to be told. I don't know. I don't know how big of a deal this is yet. And that's what I'm curious to find out. Yes, you could build like limit order books now, or you could build an Oracle using a hook. But the key question here is, you know, can the hooks that are being built enable products that are going to be much bigger than what Uniswap already has to offer? That's the question. My answer to your question is no, but we'll we'll talk more with, with, uh, with I, Ken, I think, but... yeah, I feel the same, <laughs> but you never know, right? The, um, my, my reasoning is that um, the developers that will build strategies on top of Uniswap, they will, or, or the, sorry, the independent developers uh, that build strategies on top of Uniswap and uh, and offer them as products to consumers, those people will get crushed by the likes of Wintermute, unfortunately. Um, so I think the, I mean, the tr trading at, at this frequency in the short term is basically a zero sum game. Yeah. It's extremely competitive, extremely cutthroat. Yeah. And I think the vast majority of people should not engage the, in this type of activities because they have no edge against the likes of Wintermute and, and Jump and others. So I think that, um, for as far as v4 is concerned, I think the majority of value will accrue to the professional market makers and Uniswap itself. I mean, that's also like if you look at um, v3, right, with the liquidity concentration. I mean, the, it was primarily retail focused. Now, you know, if if retail even tried to participate, they'll just get cut up in the divergence of the of the price, right? So yeah. I, I do think um, it's going to become more and more professionalized outside of v4. I also want to talk a bit about, you know, Uniswap X. You know, we, we did talk about intent-based architecture uh, maybe three podcasts ago. And the idea of being a, you know, an RFQ order aggregator that could enable price, to, uh, that could enable any asset to be found on Uniswap X and leveraging solvers, fillers to go out and chase for that uh, liquidity is a very interesting way to out-aggregate CloudSwap, One Inch Fusion, and others. And so that's going to be an interesting battle as well. It seems like there's three battles going on, right? The battle for wallets, the battle for being in the aggregator, and then obviously battle for like being the liquidity source, liquidity pools, like via AMMs. Mm -hmm. I feel like those are the three big battles that Uniswap is fighting all three on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and this touches on a, a theme that we uh, spoke about probably several, uh, during several episodes, which is that DeFi protocols once they've reached certain critical mass, they will start going horizontal and they will start competing with each other. So Uniswap, by launching Uniswap X, is competing directly with 
one inch fusion. It's almost identical to one inch fusion, and it's also competing with the likes of CalSwap. And um, on the AMM side, they're competing with like 50 other balancer. You know, in, yeah, you know, incremental improvements of AMM, uh, you know, uh, Uniswap v, V2. By the way, Uniswap found their niche in the AMM vertical. And thanks to that, they're able to bootstrap a large user base and, and really good brand, which allows them to build other products, such as the Uniswap X to yep. compete with one inch. So that's the, the second one. And then you mentioned the wallet. Mm-hmm. Um, so you I mean, you've been using Uniswap wallet for the mobile wallet for a while. I tried three it weeks now. Yeah. I've been, and, uh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So I don't really know what to make of it, but it seems like Uniswap manages to, uh, get the in app swapping approved by the app store, which I don't see on many other, uh, mobile apps. I don't know if it's a problem with the app store itself. Like, I don't know if it's because the app store doesn't allow, um, in, in app swapping. Or is it that those other apps haven't uh, haven't built a feature yet? But Uniswap has this thing that no other apps have. But w- what is your experience? Yeah, I downloaded every wallet, and for some odd reason, as you mentioned, I, I think Trust Wallet offers this the, the swaps feature, but it's not like dead center, right? Like, mm-hmm. and what I like about Uniswap is the fact that it's very easy to create private key. And it shards the private key and it stores part of it in your iCloud, right? Mm-hmm. So it's very, and it has a password that's encrypted. So, you know, every time you log in, you pop in your password, and it'll automatic, automatically decrypt your, your private key. Mm-hmm. Um, the cool thing about it is that this is easy for normies to understand, right? The average everyday person, they can just log in like they would normally wa- log in. And so as long as they keep their Apple iCloud secure, then it's fine. Two is the dead center, like, Front and center, as soon as you download the Uniswap wallet app, it takes you to the swaps phone, the swaps mm-hmm. product, which is what I think every wallet should do because that is the main, you know, we've talked about this as well, which is we should embrace speculation, right? Speculation is a key property of what crypto enables that no other sector enables. And so they kept the swaps product as dead center in the middle. So as soon as you fund the wallet, you can start trading shit coins, right? And that is what every speculator is looking for in, in the space. This reason why we have bull runs is the fact that they're all chasing tokens, right? Mm-hmm. And I do think that is going to be a killer feature or product that is going to uh, probably be like the top one, two in the app store, I think, in the next coming bull run, um, because they're the only wallet that I've seen that has focused primarily on swapping. And they make it very easy to find any shit coin that you want. Like I, I've typed in hamster i've typed in uh, <laughs> whatever right unibot etc and it found it and it was very easy i don't have to copy and paste a contract address i can find it i can trade it and for the average retail person i think that's what they want right they just want to be able to trade your coins but but if you're if they are uh, going after the the average retail trader then i think they're i mean i don't know exactly what their strategy is but if that is the case they're fighting an uphill battle against Coinbase, which owns the user, the retail on-ramp off-ramp. 100%. But in any case, the discussion we're having is that every DeFi protocol is trying to fight each other on multiple fronts, yep. including the wallet, the aggregation layer, and the AMM layer. So it will be really interesting to see how these things play out. All right. Well, with that, let's bring on Afghani and Dan. Welcome to Good Game. Today, we have uh, Dan from uh, Paradigm and Evgeny from Wintermute. And today's topic is going to be on Uniswap v4 and what it can enable, one, from a user perspective, two, founder's perspective, and then three, just the community at large. And so that's why we have uh, Evgeny from uh, Wintermute joining us. So maybe just to uh, get our audience up to date on Uniswap v4, what are some like high-level points, Dan, that, that Uniswap v4 enables uh, that users should be thinking about? Yeah, so the key thing we were trying to do with Uniswap v4 is moving Uniswap, which already moved from being just a, a single AMM strategy in Uniswap v2 into this platform for being able to provide liquidity uh, at any, um, with basically with any, any static strategy in Uniswap v3. I think the goal is to try to extend that evolution so that it can now be a platform in which you can build any kind of, any kind of uh, DAX or AMM that you want. Um, on top of the concentrated liquidity strategy implemented in Uniswap 
v3. So with v4, I think the two big changes we uh, made to try to enable that, one is to introduce these ideas of hooks, which are uh, basically the ability to extend the AMM logic to launch your own pool on the same um, on the same logic as Uniswap v3, but with extra logic added to the beginning um, or end of trades or to be at the end of liquidity provision. Um, and that allows you to open, to open a lot of design space that AMM developers might, or designers might want to add to, uh, to Uniswap and let them launch that as Uniswap v3, Uniswap v4 pools rather than as launching a, a fork or launching their own um, AMM. And then in order to make this all more efficient and to sort of reduce the cost of this multiplicity of pools, we jammed all the Uniswap v4 uh, pools, which in Uniswap v3 are all different contracts, jammed them all into one contract to make it more efficient to route across multiple of them. And both of these are, again, with the idea of trying to make it a platform for others to build on um, and not just its own AMM. Got it. So it seems like, although on Twitter, you know, and, and, and others will probably say these are marginal improvements, I kind of see this as a pretty big improvement for what could enable a whole secondary action of builders that could be building around the hook design space. Is that the idea, is to make Uniswap more of a permissionless liquidity and then enable founders to take that liquidity and, and build interesting products around it. And you kind of saw this element with like the uh, on-chain Oracle that you built out for, I think it was V2, right? Where you had the price accumulators per block and you know essentially you could allow these pools to become like price feeds. But I think the problem ended up being that it was very gas efficient and swappers were paying for the gas. And so maybe taking a step back and allowing the founders or builders to build on top of pools versus, you know, building within the pools. Is that the idea or like, how are you thinking about that? Yeah. So I think with, with Uniswap upgrades, we took this very deliberate pace. I mean, I started, I started working really seriously with them on it um, with V2. And at every, at every step, you need to choose. We want to we want to add these features, but it comes with com some complexity cost uh, if yeah. we add these. And so we can't we can't do these other features. Um, and there's trade offs everywhere there. And you know, for a while, I think there was there was some value in making those choices for users and, and for the space. You could keep things you could keep things fairly simple. Um, but we're we're starting to see. You know, there are a lot of different things that people might want from Dexas for different assets or for or with different strategies or different different kinds of, of liquidity providers and. Yeah, making every every pool pay pay the gas cost of oracles when in fact you don't always always want an oracle may not be the right trade off to make. So the idea here is seeing that okay, there is some more innovation going on outside of Uniswap, um, more outside of Uniswap probably on, in some than that is going on inside certainly now. Um, and so we want to be able to, to take advantage of all of that and allow people to build it to build it into Uniswap themselves. So yeah, so that that was the goal, and I think mean, absolutely would hope that that we see a lot of innovative hooks being built on Uniswap that we either wouldn't have chosen to do or wouldn't have, um, you know, wouldn't have made the trade-off, made the choice, uh, or wouldn't have come up with ourselves. I'll give you one example is I think in Uniswap v3, we added the ability to, to use to do multiple fee tiers. And then we actually added the ability for governance to enable more tiers on top of that. So we allowed, you know, uh, five BIP, 30 BIP, and 1% pools, but we allowed uni governance to choose more tiers to, to set and to enable. And I didn't think people would go would go lower than that, but actually, someone enabled uh, un someone made a proposal on unit governance to enable the one the one bit pool. And you know, I wasn't like opposed to that, but I th I didn't think it would get used a lot. Um, I think because I was somewhat naive actually about about market structure. And when the uh, when the one bit pool got enabled, suddenly it became for for stable coins at least just this, this massive massively competitive volume um, hog. And so I think that was a that was an interesting realization where I think people. Outside of Uniswap, had had a better sense of actually what would be the the right uh, feature to do there, and so I think we'll see something similar with Hooks as well. Evgeny, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, it's interesting. Like I would say initially, like look, I'm like from the onset, like I ever since Uniswap launched, I always got the question whether I don't know, market makers will be replaced by MMs, and I always said no because honestly, I always thought okay, like the MM model ultimately, like it can never replace market makers it can like it, it, it just it doesn't have enough parameters to simply replace uh, replace us or anyone anyone else for that matter. And when Unity 4 was announced, I was thinking okay, like it will be just another step towards just like adding more dimensions on top, like how Unity 3 added like more features, like maybe it will add like a few more things and it'll be like closer and closer to portable ultimately. But I was like once I went through the what it actually encompasses when I went through like the hooks, like some fee improvements. Well, um, 
apart from some guest optimizations or whatever, like it became clear to me that I think it's potentially like way, way more than that. It basically opens a whole new design space. It's definitely much more exciting, like from builder perspective, what it, what it opens up. Like it's, and it's really like it can really go anywhere from here. Like it can enable like whole new design space for, uh, for Dexis. Uh, but also it can like massively succeed because it's like so, mm, like it, it just opens so many possibilities, but it can also potentially fail because of that, because it's like one future, for example, is just because you have so many ways to create tools, to create like different, all kinds of different hooks, you can potentially make the market too fragmented. And I think the main, like the main challenge that we'll see in the next month or maybe year is how will, well, whether we'll see basically some of those hooks being potentially whitelisted by Uniswap Foundation, for example, to be allowed, or whether somebody else emerges to basically say, okay, which hooks are safe or not to use. Because like, if you have all those hooks that anyone, everyone can use, you open yourself to, well, for anyone malicious to actually design a hook, which is not good. And like the, that this whole like, design space would revolve around hooks about like how to whitelist or like how to ensure which hooks are worth integrating with, for example, as a market maker, uh, which hooks are worth integrating with as a market taker, because yeah, honestly, Wintermute from the onset, we've been much more active on the taker side of things, like bringing all kinds of, you could say, toxic flow to Uniswap uh, potentially, but now for us, it would be quite interesting to see, okay, yeah, if there are like thousands of new tools with the all kinds of hooks, like how do we make a decision who to integrate with and who to not to integrate with? Yeah, I, I do think there's, I think there's some challenges in, um, in hook safety. But one nice thing that the, that the contract architecture does provide is there's this fine grain permissioning for what, um, what a hook can do. And so there are some hooks. So think about the before swap and after swap hooks, which affect trades, but they don't affect the ability to add or, or especially remove liquidity. And so, um, interestingly, if you have one of these hooks, there's sort of a, there's a bound on how much you can lose actually as a market maker. Basically, you can lose the fees that you have for, to a pool that has just these hooks turned on. You can lose accrued fees, but you're not going to lose your principal relative to if the, you know, it's a, just providing a new sub P3. Um, I mean, and so, um, so I think there's, there's some, uh, you know, it allows you to be a little more fearless than you might be if it was just like, oh, this is providing on any pool, it's providing to any arbitrary contract. And similarly for a swapper, uh, you may not actually care what what pools you trade on, um, as long as you uh, you know what assets you get out, right? And so, actually, to some extent, the hook architecture and the router can actually enforce for you the the property you would care about, which is not um, not losing your money without you actually having to know anything about the logic of the pools you're trading on. You just revert if the uh, if the pool doesn't give you out the money that you were expecting. So, I think there, there's some things to, to provide there, but then again, yeah, absolutely, you still want to evaluate the logic of any of any hook that you're providing you to see if. Um, a friend liquidity to to see if it's um, yeah if it's worth integrating or, or worth putting your capital in there, and especially for ones that have other there are other hooks that, that could potentially cause loss of, ca- of capital for liquidity providers. I have a follow up question for um, both of you. So Dan, um, first question uh, related to something that Afghani said about liquidity fragmentation. So my understanding is for every pair, uh, let's say uh, ETH USDT you can have multiple strategies, right? Multiple pools. So that that's what theoretically leads to uh, liquidity fragmentation. But from a taker's point of view, does Uniswap like automatically plays like the one inch role, like the liquidity aggregator role that whereby it routes the trade to the best price? Because if that's the case, there there is no fragmentation of liquidity. How do you think about that? Is that, is that something that you guys are thinking about? Well, there's some fragmentation of liquidity in part because the there's a gas cost to drowning across multiple pools. And so if there are many different pools, there's some cost to the, to the swapper in terms of they, their, their trade has to be split across multiple pools, maybe, or has to go to some complicated pool or something to um, to be able to trade. There's a subtler, I think, market structure uh, issue with, with fragmentation, which is if you have many different pools and you can, for example, have pools that, that have like one bit lower fees than, than each other. And actually, uh, uh, recently Alexander and Logan was talking about this, this concept on, on Twitter, but there's the potential for one hook to undermine another hook by having slightly lower fees. And then you might actually get a race to the bottom where, um, you hooks will compete with each other for, um, for the vast, 
uh, majority of uninformed flow by having like slightly lower uh, lower uh, liquidity than others. So there's a bit of a, of a, of a cost of anarchy there. And in, in if you allow just any um, uh, hooks to be deployed with any fees. Um, so those are, I think, the two major costs of, of liquidity fragmentation. Um, but I think, you know, the the goal of it is not necessarily that there's Oh, tons of you know, tons of strategies, and um, and everything is being routed across you know fifty different pools in every trade. I think the goal is you you learn and you discover from from what happens in the pool actually where the where the liquidity wants to go or where the what the best design is, and then a lot aggregates there. And we saw that with the thirty bit and five bit USDC pools. We're going in. I probably would have predicted that the that the thirty bit pool would have uh, and, and ETH USDC on Uniswap ETH would have been dominant. Um, and in fact, by far, the five-bit pool is, is the dominant pool. Um, and again, I think, I think in hindsight, there's reasons to understand why that was the case. But it's not something that we would have predicted. And I think if we'd, if we'd said, oh, there must be one, um, one fee tier, we would have said it's at least somewhat higher than, than the five-bit um, uh, pool. And so I think that uh, getting, getting that kind of just permissionless innovation um, on top of it in order, in order, hopefully, for a lot of liquidity to pool in in some surprising pool, in some pool that actually like really works, that captures leverage yeah. users or is, or is really good at setting its fees. That's the goal. Just a uh, quick uh, follow up on that. Isn't that what you want though? Like having many different market makers compete and potentially provide the best price to the taker. Don't don't you want like very competitive landscape? Because that's essentially what happens on order books on centralized exchanges. You have players like Winner Mute and Jump and many others compete to give the best price. Yes, potentially, but. Possibly that could all be on the same pool, and there may be designs where that might work. And in, in you know, in B three, to some sense, sometimes um, active liquidity providers are basically competing with each other on that platform. Uh, but yeah, I, and I, I think it would be great if there are multiple liquidity pools. I just, I'm not, I don't think there will be a mapping of like liquidity provider to each liquidity provider has their own pool that, that implements their own strategy. I think it's going to be a little more. Um, it's going to be more like a mapping of like feature of sort of like just, just what kind of features in an AMM you might want. I don't know. I'm getting may have made more thoughts on that. Yeah, so I think it, like for more traditional market makers like us, it would kind of depend, like the design of set of different kinds of like pools with different hooks enabled would, would play a pretty big role. Like, for example, you can have pools with just in time liquidity, uh, sort of like disabled by it means of introducing extra fees for withdrawing liquidity. And you can have pools which basically would not uh, penalize market makers to do that. And so, like, they potentially would work in a kind of like similar way to how CowSwap operates. And I think, like, what you will see is this design space where you will have liquidity providers, like, more like lazy or whatever, very, very passive, like, classic unit V2 liquidity providers in one set of pools. And yeah, somebody like us providing liquidity on other type of pools. And then, yeah, you just want to do the aggregation uh, in the background. So, follow up question on. Uh, for you, Evgeny. So you said earlier that Wintermute is currently active on Uniswap v3, but is more active on the taker side than on the maker side. You know, you you're the one who contribute some of that toxic flow to the market makers. And anecdotally, I've heard something very similar from other professional market makers: is that they're more active as a taker than as a maker. So my question is: Does the current design or vision of Uniswap v4 sound like something that makes you want to provide liquidity more, be more active on the maker side. Yeah, potentially, because, yeah, it can enable us, especially with all the, if you couple it with all the gas efficiency improvements, which was another, like, pretty big challenge for us, because even if we wanted to provide liquidity on Uni V3, it's still, sometimes you would want to withdraw it, sometimes you would want to add it, and it's just pretty gas inefficient to do it, like, continuously like this. But, yeah, in Coupled with uh, gas efficiency improvements, coupled with like all this like improvements on single con- singleton contract, like as I think it might start to make sense for us to at least like experiment more in this space. Yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, I heard one of your talks recently within the I think it was the Uniswap podcast where you talked about the MCAMM. Maybe talk a bit about that, but uh, you know, maybe just a high level. The idea here is loss versus rebalancing. Does it make sense for makers to give a free option to arbitrageurs by essentially getting a price, uh, being able to arbitrage the price from, let's say, Uniswap to, let's say, Binance or, or, or Coinbase? And now there's a concept of potentially paying a fee or a, a re- like rent, like a rent fee to block builders, to LPs. 
Uh, I'm curious on what you're thinking is there. And, and I obviously want to hear Evgeny's thoughts here as well. Yeah. So um, this is one part of the family of family of possible hooks that we think could help mitigate lever. Um, so this is, it's a, and I think we don't have a, a full design for this. And I think fully, fully open about that where they part of the idea of open, uh, of opening up this hook design spaces to see what people, what people can do in the, in the space. But one interesting line of research in lever has been, Instead of so, this is a free option, right? That that when there's a liquidity on uh, in the pool at the beginning of a block, um, and the price has changed recently, you're effectively yeah giving away this option to trade against it. And the question is, well, what if instead we charge for this option um, in one way or another? We 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 charge a premium, and we have that. What that requires is for somebody ahead of time, or th- this particular version of the um, of the design is that somebody ahead of time, at least in the previous block needs to have basically purchased this right to be the first trader in a block. Um, or there's, there's different variants on this idea, but, but functionally somebody pays ahead of time and they get the, the right to be the first trader or to trade without fees in the beginning of a block. And so the, yes, the advantage of, of that is um, the liquidity writers basically get or earning this rent and then, yeah, they're, they're still getting uh, traded against, uh, maybe traded against with no fee in that block, but they're being paid ahead of time for that, for the expectation of the, of the profit that the, the arbitrator will be able to get from there. And so, yes, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting idea proposed by Alex Herman, um, and, and I think there have been a few, uh, some other proposals out there about it. My, my variant that I, I think is pretty interesting, although I'm not sure how to get it to work quite yet, would be um, to have, to auction off not just the right to, uh, to be the first trader, but actually the right to, to re- receive all the fees from a pool and also the right to receive the fees that are, that are paid into a, into a pool. And the interesting thing about that is now you've, you've basically found this off-chain agent. So someone like Evgeny, you know, someone who can run all these models and know exactly the, how best to, um, to take advantage of, of this right if they were to, if they were to pay for it. So when some, some off-chain agent would be able to do all the calculations, they go, okay, here's actually the ideal fee that we should set. And this solves this problem um, of like, of setting the, the fee and the dynamic fee, setting, setting a fee in Uniswap that is, uh, that maximizes revenue. Um, and then you have this option agent that's that's aligned to be able to do that. But I think there's a lot of challenges to that, and I think the, the mechanism doesn't quite work yet. Um, so I so I hesitate to um, to be too confident about that or any other particular hook design for lever reduction. Evgeny, would you pay a rent fee to get fees and to set the fees and uh, be, to be able to get essentially that free option right to trade against the LP providers? Yeah, I mean it's not the most weird thanks design, right? It's like we've seen. More strange things, I guess. And it's not that, that, um, I mean, that, I think it would be interesting to play with, yes. Like it's given the overall complexity in like DAXs and like trading on MMs currently, it's, it doesn't add that much. Like we've been any trading firm can sort of estimate how much they are willing to pay for it. And I think like it's, it would be quite, quite interesting because. Like, especially firms with better understanding of, well, like options and current implied volatility in the market. Yes, it would be definitely an advantage of like trading on those kind, on those kind of like DEXs, basically. Yeah. yeah, I think it would be fun. Evgeny, and, and you mentioned earlier that one of the key value propositions of Unison before is the fee reduction. Dan, do you have any early estimate of how much lower fees will be, both for contract deployment as as well as swapping so yes i'm sorry for yeah for contract deployment i think it's um i believe the estimate is around 99 percent cheaper so it's, it's, it's dramatically cheaper for swapping um i don't have an exact number in part because the, the code isn't finalized and uh the whole thing depends on an upgrade to um the to the evm that is scheduled for the canker and hard fork but uh, until then, it's actually somewhat hard to test in a lot of realistic scenarios what the gas cost will be. But the primary place where savings comes from is from um, not having to have these intermediate in- intermediate ERC twenty transfers on a pool when you when you trade with multiple across pools when you trade with multiple um, pools. So it should it should save uh, maybe around like five ten ten k per pool rounded against. And, and what is the current cost of uh, for for V three the current cost of uh, contract deployment? Oh, contract deployment. Um, it's somewhere in the in the millions of uh, of gas, I think. Um, okay. I'll have to check. So that should go down to uh, tens of thousands, something like that. Yeah. Mm. I actually have a question to Dan on that as well. Like it's like to me, it's all exciting. Like 
the gas fee improvements on one hand it's all exciting and interesting and like there are quite a few like well 1153 1155 it's all going to be like improving it quite significantly but like what kind of future do you see basically like if we like one, one future that a lot of people are promoting is like all training will move to l2 l2s like all training will be on arbitrum and optimism and what's not and polygon and like what are those fee like uh, gas efficiency improvements even relevant in the long run if all trading moves away basically i think it will be i think in part because um you know as you know in in traditional markets there's basically no end to how much benefit you can get from from higher performance and and uh lower latency and more optimization um and so i think regardless of the platform that you're that you're running this on efficiency is going to is going to be really important and i do think this especially with with um l2s uh when you when you're doing dex trading you know there's there's it's always competitive and so i think there's you know if you make it cheaper it's just people are going to do more of it basically there's going to be more uh, arbitrage more frequently and i think that or or people are going to route across more pools in order to take advantage of the, whatever bandwidth you can provide um and so yeah i think there's i think there's always going to be benefits in in reducing gas now i, I do think if you there are ways to get potentially like 10x or almost or maybe 100x improvement in um, in uh, the ga- these gas costs by adopting a different architecture, maybe by not doing something on the EVM. And I think there's that's there's just a lot of uh, interesting work in that area. And I think some of the, you know, but I think especially for EVM L2, L2s, I'm very happy that we're also optimizing yeah how, how V4 will work on those. So uh, speaking of the layer twos, I actually looked at the uh, trading volume of on Uniswap across the various layer twos this morning. And I saw that the Uniswap on Arbitrum is trading about half of what's being traded on the Uniswap mainnet on Ethereum layer one. So it's a pretty, pretty impressive number. Do you have any plans for Uniswap to go even further on the layer twos? For example, do you, are you even thinking about supporting the non EVM layer twos? Any of sort, any source of uh, the, those those ideas about layer twos? Yeah, I think there's nothing really specific yet. I think we always kept an eye on the on L twos. What I will say is, when you look at just the pie chart of where Uniswap um, users, the, the system, Uniswap LPs and uh, swappers, where they're where the value is leaking out of that system, quite a lot of it is being paid to EIP fifteen fifty nine right now. Quite a lot of it is being burned in ETH, um, and that's just sort of purely about about just the platform that you're on and the and uh, uh, gas machine transaction costs and so I think the and then it it also the the higher the transaction costs are uh, the higher lever is as well because you've you've arbitrage freight trades happening less frequently so more value leaks actually to arbitrage and so um, I do think that's a going to be a really important we're just reducing the gas cost you know before is, is a step in that direction um, some other stuff that that, that uh, should be launching I think t- uh, today um, uh, as we record this podcast, uh, is another step in that direction. But I think L2s um, and scaling generally is going to be another huge step for that. So I think it's a big area of focus going forward. How do you see the landscape moving forward uh, in terms of like you have startups like Conduit, Caldera, and others that are offering kind of like app as a service model? And let's play a hypothetical and say that, you know, uh, one of these apps becomes like a billion dollar market cap slash, you know, a lot of value that's being created within that rollup. How do you see Uniswap extend to those environments? Yeah, well, I think it's, uh, I think we will always see a synchronous DEX on every L2 platform. And I think so part of Uniswap's, uh, part of the strategy is like, let's have, let's have a, a Uniswap on every, basically on every, on every platform and try to get, and try to get usage for those sort of atomic trades on the platform. But I think another huge part of it is going to be how do we get trades to happen across these platforms? How do we, how, you know, if there's, if there's uh, multiple uh, conduit or uh, full disclosure, Paradigm's invested in conduit. And, and here, um, I should say in general, like, you know, I work at Paradigm, work at Dress Investment Firm, but I may or not talking about on behalf of them, these are, these are my own views, we do have investments in the space. If you have multiple conduit tra- chains, I think it's often really important for people to be able to trade directly from one uh, roll up to another or from, or to have faster exits from, um, an optimistic roll up, uh, or even a ZK roll up to mainnet. 
And I think, so as we, as we see a lot of these, I think cross chain or cross raw trading is going to be increasingly important. And again, um, hopefully an, an announcement that is, you know, within, within many hours as we record this, um, we'll, we'll talk a little more about our plans for that. And Evgeny, how do you, um, as a firm, how are you uh, interacting with, uh, you know, Uniswap across all the different stack, you know, layer ones, layer twos, et cetera? Um, or, or how do you see the fragmentation of, of the space from that perspective? Yeah, I think like mainnet is more, like is more complex on our side because we are not only, like it's not only trainings that we need to be involved on, like we need to involve to be involved and in well, even on like on our block building side of things as well, just to be competitive. So it's much more complex compared to others. But yeah, it's like I, the way the way I see it is a lot of this competition will move to L2s ultimately because it's like it's just it just ultimately will be just cheaper than mainnet. So that's if you're talking a mass about mass adoptions, that's where like we should be building towards, we should be ready to be competitive on L2s primarily. But that being said, it's like mainnet is still much easier for people to connect to, to bridge liquidity to, to basically, yeah, to just, to just trade on. So like we can we kind of like see our strategy being, yes, yeah, supporting both L2s and uh, the mainnet and basically all kinds of side chains as well. Evgeny, do you guys see a, any other interesting DEXs outside of Uniswap? It could be a spot DEX, could be derivatives. I mean, I'm very curious to how DYDX experiment will play out with uh, this V4. Uh, yeah, another V4 to look out for. Um, because yeah, that's like that's going to be like a proper experimentation and basically properly decentralizing a derivative DEX, like like really really properly with. Basically, validators running like running the matching engine, potentially even like third parties running the front ends. Like it's going to be like very much decentralized, and uh, I'm very curious like how throughput will look like because we're still like we're still in very much experimentation stage on actually the test and the test net and uh, seeing like how to what will change for us. But it's basically I think like for DYDX, they're opening up a whole new design space as well uh, with like with a new iter- iteration. And so just and for, for full disclosure, yeah, we, we are a pretty big investor, well, holder, I guess, now uh, in DYDX. <laughs> I saw an interesting startup, Dan, um, called Oku Trade that's built on top of Uniswap V3. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, like, what is Uniswap going to look like a few years from now, right? Like, you have, and it, we'll dive deeper into the hooks and, and all what it can enable, but is the idea really for Uniswap to have permissionless liquidity? And then you have like front ends like Oku Trade that's building advanced trading, like UI UX hooks that can enable new parameters that can allow either for dynamic fees or TWAMs or Oracle designs. Like, where where do you see all of this going? Yeah. So, for, from my perspective, I think what's most important about Uniswap is that it'd be the best place to trade every asset, um, and I think that requires doing a lot of work at the plumbing layer to make it. Um, a uh, uh, just sort of just yes, exactly. A, a good place for permissionless liquidity. I do think it's also very important to to have innovation at the UX layer, both at Uniswap Labs, um, where they work. You know, where they have a wallet that um, that that uh, supports trading on Uniswap, as well as uh, in the supporting the interface um, uh, at app.uniswap.org. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that that is now a fraction of the liquidity of of the uh, uh, volume that goes on Uniswap. I think. If you, if you look around the interface volume, it's around 15% or so of total Uniswap volume. And so I think already we are in a, we are in a case where most of this volume is going to, to Uniswap. The protocol um, is not being driven by, by products that uh, Uniswap Labs itself is building. And so I think it already is very important that, yeah, that it be able open to, to being integrated um, by, other, by other platforms. I think V4 makes that even more important because it is a very tough routing problem, for example, to, um, uh, to route. Uh, I, I optim, uh, optimally across Uniswap you know, V4 pools. And so I think having, you know, one inch uh, and other aggregators be able to aggregate um, uh, V4 pools is very important. And then, yeah, I think there's a lot of room for products that make that a lot of these pains easier um, and, uh, make, you know, bring on different kinds of users. Uh, yeah, I think I saw the, the Oku uh, uh, interface. And um, uh, yeah, you know, I think there's there's many different kinds of assets out there. There's many different kinds of uh, of um, user experiences that people want. And I think the, the goal of having Uniswap yeah, is to be able to, to support all of those. Um, and I think there'll be a lot of business to be built on top of um, really connecting those needs. So uh, on the topic of uh, long-term vision, obviously this whole debate between 
AMMs versus order books since the early days of DeFi summer have been something that, that's been probably on both of your, your minds. I think in hindsight, I think I understand AMMs, uh, why we do AMMs. I think AMMs were designed that way they were largely because of the gas constraints. In my mind, if gas w- was completely free, um, I would probably just do an order book uh, because that gives market makers like Wintermute and others a lot more flexibility. But my question for you, Dan, is do you ever see Uniswap become an order book many, many, many years from now uh, when gas fees go down by, by a lot? Um, yeah, I, I, I would say I am not religious at all about and have not been for, for at least a couple of years now about um, AMMs and being like, oh, Uniswap is an AMM. I think Uniswap is a DEX. Um, and we are, it is whatever the best um, uh, implementation of a DEX for the environment, for the Ethereum environment uh, and on-chain trading and, and non-custodial trading, um, that's what Uniswap should be. I think that has been an AMM. I think with, with Uniswap v3, it's much closer to a um, uh, central limit order book than, than it was before. And in fact, it's, I, I would say it's about as, Uniswap v3 is about as close to a central limit order book as it is to an AMM uh, that you would describe like Uniswap v2. Uh, um, so I think already we're, we're sort of there and the, uh, you know, we, we ended the, the central limit order book and AMM wars with a marriage, um, uh, you know, and, and, and an alliance. I think the, uh, you know, but, but that's, I, I don't think that's the end state of, of how this, these markets are designed out, uh, either. I would also say though, traditional markets also are not as dominated by central limit order books as, as you might think. If especially if you spent like you know your career trading equities or something, if you're trading other other kinds of assets, um, when you think about obviously, I mean um, uh, stuff like you know real estate or whatever doesn't trade on, on an order book. Um, but if you think about like like options, you know those are typically traded through um, more, more volume on that is traded through RFQs than um, than just like with with, on, with uh, limit order books. And I think a lot of it depends on the type of asset or on the type of market participants. There's a lot that goes on in, in dark pools. There's a lot that, that goes on, you know, just sort of uh, voice trading over, uh, um, over the counter, like all kinds of different ways that markets can, can um, function. And so this idea that the central limit order book is like the, the you know, uh, end state of history, I think isn't even true in traditional finance. And I think it's not going to be true, um, not literally true. In, um, in decentralized finance either. So that's an interesting topic then. Um, the, in, in TradFi, there's a, a bunch of different ways to trade. There's order books, there's dark pools, there's auctions, there's RFQs, there's a bunch of OTC trading as well. Evgeny, like any new design that you want to, that you want to see in, in the DEX space that, you know, we can potentially borrow from, from TradFi that doesn't exist today in DeFi yet. Uh, I think like most of the building blocks or most like primitives already do exist. I kind of like very much mirror dense words about like how TradFi works. If you like for us, for example, for example, as a market maker, it doesn't really matter whether DeFi will settle on Central Order Book or AMM because like the way I see us providing liquidity will be basically through aggregators mostly. Like that's my, that's yeah. been my central, ha- central uh, thesis for the last two years or so. It's that ultimately will arrive at some form of Robinhood effectively. Because if you look, look at Robinhood, Robinhood is effectively an RFQ platform on top of central order books. Like they do rely on central order books to exist to basically improve the pricing, but ultimately, I don't know, Citadel and others, they provide liquidity there by trying to improve that. And they effectively get all this juicy retail flow just by basically existing on top of central order books. And I think where DeFi will go in that regard is, yeah, my my bet is like RFQs, they're basically aggregators, like one inches. And I mean, that, that's why we uh, invested quite a bit in our own uh, aggregated people as well. Like, I think that's that's where the future is when, when you're talking about retail facing apps or dApps or whatever. I think that's, that's actually going to be the most exciting design space for us as a market maker. I think that in general, the more complexity there is in a market, the better it is for, for market makers. Because the more fun the game is, uh, the more interesting strategies it can build. So, well, it's fun. It's fun, but also like, well, the more complex the space, the more you can differentiate yourself from your competitors, from less sophisticated yep. competitors by building all kinds of modes. And then, Threadfy at the moment, it's 
Unfortunately, I would say it's like it's a to a very large degree a speed game. So it's basically investing tens of millions in the infrastructure, which is actually part of the reason I left Redfi as well, because I was just it was just like a rat race to the bottom, which was not exciting to me at all. Like shaving off all this like nanoseconds is just I don't know, doesn't add up anything. And it's just basically creating a lot of costs for no good reason. But ultimately yeah, like we'll see similar kind of race in DeFi eventually as well, where like, I mean, we already see it with like block building, for example. It's already like you need yeah. to be quite sophisticated to to actually participate in this market. And you see a very limited number of people actually being very competitive in the space. And so, yeah, we will we'll see similar kind of like arms race based on sophistication, not on things else. Um, so speaking of that, there is a, uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're rightly pointing out that there is searchers that are trying to become proposers and, and, and validators so that they can basically do the trading and the uh, and the validating in a co-location like in in like uh in a physical in one physical location uh, to reduce latency are you guys thinking about that or is winter me thinking about that or maybe you guys are doing it already uh well we are thinking about that that's all, that's all i can say yeah <laughs> <laughs> Looks like uh, Uniswap just launched uh, Uniswap X. Just saw that announcement. So, and I think this is something that Daniel were alluding to earlier. I quickly glanced over it, so I'll probably need your feedback on this, but it seems like an aggregator. Yeah, well, I, I would think about it as basically it's a protocol for trading on Uniswap using off, uh, signed signed orders rather than transactions. So typically with, with Uniswap, you know, when, when you want to trade on, on Uniswap on chain right now, you uh, and you go through the interface, you create a transaction um, that trades with some specific set of pools. And so Uniswap X is a protocol where instead the user signs uh, a signed order saying, basically, here's the trade I want to do. Signs their intent to use the parlance of our times, um, expressing what they what they want to trade. And um, fillers compete to fill those uh, those orders. And anyway, this is not this is not it's not the first protocol um, with with some of these these characteristics. But the key idea there the idea there is trying to unlock more power from um, yeah from these signed uh, signed orders rather than um, uh, uh, limiting users in the way that currently the interface forces them basically to submit their orders to a transaction. Oh, this is uh, cool. Uh, so, like, I mean, uh, intent-based architecture, um, for the users that don't know, uh, we talked about this two couple podcasts ago, but essentially users can sign what they want, and then there could be solvers that can solve that complexity in terms of what you're looking for within that transaction between uh, within the constraints that you're looking for. And so some people have alluded that aggregators are kind of like intent-based architectures, which is kind of true. But what I like about this is that uh, it's cross-chain. So like essentially the uh, solvers or the fillers are able to source that liquidity and be able to help provide that uh, liquidity for the users that are looking for it, right? That's right, yeah. So so yes, it's true that in addition to this liquidity, you know, the, the, the order is expressed as a transaction, as a... Um, or signed order rather than transaction, it does mean that fillers can source liquidity from anywhere. Got it. Um, including from other from other decks on chain or from off chain sources. Are you guys using a, a Noma, or is this something that's built in? How, like, how does the architecture look like? Yeah, so it's it's its own architecture, and it's it's not it's a relatively simple protocol. And we released the white paper as well today. Um, okay. But uh, the basic idea is, yeah, it's, it, you sign a, a transaction, you sign an, a signed order, and when someone submits it, it gets filled on on a um, it's called a reactor contract on um, on Ethereum mainnet, um, and the, a couple of the innovations there. One is, uh, uh, or the features that it uses to, to help uh, make competitive orders. Um, one is that over time um, you can set these up as as what we call Dutch orders, so that over time the the price changes in order to make it more attractive for fillers. That's one way to get a competitive fill. I think One Inch Fusion actually had a similar feature that they that they launched um, with as well. And the other is that um, uh, it allows the price, the initial price, can be set using any um, any method. And Uniswap launched in beta today um, a protocol for or a, a, a um, application that does this using a, using an off-chain RFQ like system, presenting the initial price and finding the initial filler. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. And it's coming out this summer, it seems like. So uh, I'm excited to try it out. Yeah, because Again, I think what it's live today. Oh, it's live today? Yeah. But nice. Yeah, but what, what I'm actually what I'm really excited about in this and and um, I want to highlight as I mentioned I mentioned earlier on the call about um, uh, cross roll up um, or cross chain trading, and I think this this method mm. of signed orders with with cross um, is, with signed orders with a Dutch with a Dutch auction um, built in is a really I think uh, uh, elegant method for doing cross chain trading, and you can do that with just a single 
uh, cross uh, chain um, uh, message oracle. Um, but if you if you have just a single a single bridge that can go from uh, one direction on a chain, you can do it a dash action in the other direction. So what UseOpX enables is a really efficient um, uh, cross chain trading or, or or fast exits from rollups um, or cross rollup trading. And I think that's just that's just a really powerful thing to add to the Uniswap front end. Just to confirm, cr- cross chain trading. Uh, is trading on Uniswap from one chain to Uniswap from another chain, right? So, no, like so trading. Well, between- is, a user has assets on one um, on one chain, and they want mm-hmm. some other asset um, on some other chain, and they can mm-hmm. trade. They can trade like that. Or this is not this is not yet live. So this is something we're hoping to launch later this year. Um, but the design for it, the basic design for it, is in the way. Um, the idea is the uh, user. Uh, want some assets on some other chain, so they are able to basically sign an order on the first chain, and then a filler will come fill them on the on, uh, claim that order, and then fill them on the destination chain, the chain that they want to trade onto. And then it's the filler's job basically to send the message um, back from the destination chain to the source chain in order to to claim the asset, the user's assets. But uh, for the user, hopefully, it's it's basically a seamless experience where they just sign an order um, on the source chain, and then immediately without having to pay gas on both chains or anything receive an asset on the on the destination chain. And the nice thing the for trading- the filler is they don't have, because this is all off-chain liquidity, they don't actually have to um, have passive exposure to the to the bridge risk, nor does the swapper. Only only while the, the trade is basically in flight does either party have um, exposure to, to bridge risk. So we're trying to reduce some of the risk of, of bridge hacks. Does any of the trading happens on the Uniswap protocol, the existing Uniswap protocols, or is this, is this a totally separate protocol? This, especially for, for, for cross-chain swapping, this would generally be a totally separate protocol, though it's possible that one user, you know, the a filler might be able to trade on Uniswap in order to fill the user on one Got side it. or another. Um, Got it. But yes, it's, it's a, it, it would be its own protocol. How does a messaging protocol work? So it's agnostic as to the messaging layer. So you could use any bridge. You can use Chainlink or, or Layer Zero or um, or Sync or any of these other uh, uh, protocols that support cross, uh, cross-chain messages. The, the filler can't decide w- what bridge they want to use. The swapper would decide what bridge they're willing to accept, and the filler then you know can choose which ones they, which orders they're willing to fill based on whether they accept the same bridge. Got it. Evgeny, uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, do you see Wintermute becoming a filler? Also, I mean, that's 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 literally what we discussed like 10, 15 minutes ago. It's like for us, that's that's exactly where I saw the market would go. Like this is this like kind of two model solver model where effectively we would be on. The other sides, like if somebody wants to swap on mainnet or somebody wants to swap from mainnet to Polygon or whatever, like that's, yeah, that's literally where the market should be heading. So, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, very much in line with how, how we see where the market should be heading, I guess. But yeah, it's quite, quite exciting that, uh, yeah, you just hope actually launches it, uh, that's that fast. Really, really looking forward to like the cross chain part of it. I think that's, that's the most interesting part. So, any other questions on that show that you, know, you want to talk about before I switch topics? I also see um, MEV protection and yeah. no cost for failed transactions. I mean, the no cost for failed transactions for me personally is a big deal. Yeah. I, <laughs> I just hate the signing a failed transaction and pay the fees. It's just really annoying. MEV pr- protection is also really interesting. So basically, um, whenever, whenever there is some leftover MEV, the protocol re- would return it back to the end user. Yeah, so, that, so to be, yeah, I, I, I want to be careful about exactly how to, how to explain this, um, because, you know, it's, it, there's, it's, it has some internalization of MEV basically that's in, in, uh, specific to the design. And then there's also ways that you can use these off-chain orders and try and try to uh, route them into who you share them with to try to minimize the MEV that you expose. But the basic idea is that the, the way that a sandwich attack works in, in Uniswap, right, is that um, when you're trading, like you're you basically depending on what the price on chain um, uh, on this AMM is, and so if if somebody trades ahead of you on the AMM, they can actually cause you to get a worse price than this. And with these, these are basically just limit orders. Um, these uh, when you when you're signing this, right? At any given particular time, it's it's a it's a limit order. And so um, whether you get this the set the limit order price by um, uh, by off chain doing like an RFQ process, and there you put your you're basically protected from um, what would ha- what might happen in Uniswap v3 if you sign a to title limit order, which is your transaction gets included, but it fails here, it doesn't get included at all. Um, so there's so there you're protected in that way. And then um, this the Dutch auction mechanism where where the price gets better over time means that basically yeah, as soon as your your order is actually competitive to 
um, uh, they'll get um, uh, it executes. Now, this doesn't mean there's no MEV um, when you do the Dutch auction, for example, as, 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 we, as we have to know. A lot of Dutch, uh, Dutch auctions on chain actually pretty, create um, some MEV, and a lot of it depends on the parameterization of how this exactly works. But I think zooming out from the particular mechanisms, um, the key idea here is that you get a lot more flexibility when you're working with intents, when you're working with signed orders, than you do um, when you have when you have a transaction. And so I think the idea here is I think this is the future of MEV. You're able to do things like this, which could be something like a batch auction. It could be something um, like an RFQ. It could be it could be um, uh, something more like a dark pool. Uh, but when you, now that you're dealing with with signed orders, there's a lot more potential um, for for more sophisticated MEV prevention. Got it. I want to go back to hooks and then maybe close it out soon after. But uh, you know, uh, I think one idea that I want to touch on uh, just I had a very interesting question was like the, you you launch, you uh, published a white paper with Dave White on TWAMS time weighted average market maker, uh, which is like a volume based TWAP order over a given period of time. Um, and uh, the idea time, here time is weighted, time weighted um, orders, not not volume weighted. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, time weighted. Um, and the idea here is, you know, instead of like you know market buying or market selling, you're able to express that order over a given period of time, right? And uh, I found this to be very interesting because this liquidity has to be taken by passive liquidity providers, right? Yeah. So um, yeah. what I, what I really like about TUM. One of the many things I like about TUM is that it's a kind of non-aggregatable flow. Yeah. Um, if you really want to execute like exactly the, the, the TWAP price over this time, want the guarantee that you got the TWAP on the on the AMM. Um, this is ba- sort of basically the only way to do it. Well, I mean, I you could do something like more like a um, you could like do it contractually with someone off chain, um, uh, but um, and sort of more like a like a like a principal trading model, but. Um, uh, in order, to, in order to really get this execution, you have to build it into the chain, and that is a kind of it's a it's a defensible mode in my view, and, and potentially for passive liquidity. It's like, why do we have passive liquidity? Um, are they always just going to be offering these twelve second, um, you know, uh, late uh, 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 offers? And I think one of the reasons is no, because when you if you really want to execute uh, Q up liquidity against it, a Q up volume against it, that's non aggregatable. That that has to actually execute on um, against passive. So it's a real advantage potentially for passive liquidity. Passive liquidity. I feel like hooks are just generally an ad, ad, advantage. There's a series of advantages of being a, a passive liquidity provider now versus before, which I think is very interesting. As you mentioned on like, you know, whether it's dynamic fees or MCAMMs, there's part of the fees that start to go back to liquidity providers. And with TWAMs and let's just say TWAM, uh, TWAMs start to take flight, I could see a world where it's profitable to be a, a passive liquidity provider. And that's always been an issue over the past, you know, three iterations of Uniswap, which is like the impermanent loss issue. And so I guess the question Wait, actually, here is... Speaking of that, sorry, go ahead. Speaking yeah. of that, quick question. Have you guys analyzed the impermanent loss on Uniswap over the last two years, like since Uniswap V3? Like, is it positive or negative? Like, do, do market makers make money? It depends on the, it depends on the pool. Um, but I think a, lo- a lot of studies have shown that for the, the highest volume pool um, for Uniswap, um, for, sorry, USDC, we on Uniswap V3, these are a number of analyses. Uh, I think a lot depends on how you measure it. Um, say that most liquidity providers, the average liquidity provider on those, loses money. Lose money. They lose money. Lose money. Yeah. 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 I, I, don't know why, I don't know why they do it. I think, there's, I think there are a lot of subtleties in there. Um, yeah. And I think a lot depends on which liquidity provider you are. And I think a lot depends on what else you're doing and what, and what your goals are. Uh, with that, so it's 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 sort of, a, but it is an interesting paradox. And if someone has a really good resolution to this paradox, I would be curious to see it because it is it, it is sort of interesting. Like all the studies say, they lose money, and yet it is the highest volume, highest liquidity. Um, well, I think what one sort of resolution to it. If you were talking before about this, you know, competition of um, of uh, for for uh, retail volume is basically on um, on Ethereum. All you know, basically, I think I think. This, I don't. I don't know exactly that it is. My guess is well, it's all the like retail volume basically goes to you know, that that pool. All the retail with USDC volume goes there because it has these really tight uh, spreads. And so the prize, if you're a really good liquidity provider on this pool, is you basically get this piece of this of all the retail volume, um, all the all the uninformed flow. And so there's just like a really a serious competition for it on this on this pool. And that competition, I think, means that like on average, liquidity providers aren't making money. But sort of, you have to actually be there to, to be in the game at all, and so that's the. Uh, I think that that's that's roughly how I would put it. Um, I don't have a really formal explanation for how that works or, or what that means, um, but I think that's the way that I think about it. 
Yeah, because I, I, it's, I it's, really it's incredibly low spread. It's a, it's a very competitive um, uh, spread, given again that these 12 second quotes. Evgeny, do you provide uh, liquidity on the maker side? Uh, not on the MMs, no. I mean, yeah, it's, it's just, it just doesn't work for us as a model. Yeah, got it. I, I, so, I also don't know who these people are. I really <laughs> don't. It's, it's sort of, it is odd. Like the people that I know in the industry don't provide liquidity on that pool. So I, 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 honest, I feel sort of dumb about it because I think maybe I should know. I, but I, it's not clear to me where all this liquidity comes from. I guess just going back to the original question, which is, you know, it seems like fees are being paid. Like there is some focus on hooks being an advantage for passive LP providers, right? Um, is that the intent is to provide more value to liquidity providers in the long run? Or is it just primarily based on like what's best for Uniswap and, and the products that you're, you're building over there? Because I could see like TWAM, like if people start using TWAMs and like, and you have to use native Uniswap, then there's a clear advantage of using Uniswap over, let's say, a one inch or, or matcha. Yeah. Right? And is that the intent? Yeah. Like, is to provide more value yes. to, okay. So the way I, the way I see it is I think there's, there's three big lines of DEX research. And one of them I alluded to, uh, so these, these are about where the value leaks out of the system. Yeah. Um, and one of them I alluded to earlier is just to, to transaction costs. So you have to 1559 ETH bean burn. Um, and that's that's where I think like scaling is a, uh, and and gas cost uh, reduction are really important um, uh, goals and both both before and um, and you swap X I think to some extent address the gas cost reduction but I think there's there's maybe a long way to go on that um, the second one is is loss versus rebalancing or generally losses from from liquidity providers and you swap before is designed to try to um, to reduce that loss and try to really protect liquidity providers from from um, losses to arbitrage and make it competitive to be able to provide liquidity. To this system, uh, and then the third is losses by by traders to, to being to slippage to being sandwiched um, to suboptimal execution generally, um, suboptimal routing, um, and that's what Uniswap X is trying to is trying to address, it's trying to get optimal execution for for swappers. I think you just can't have a um, we can't have a solution to any of these problems that is like well we'll just screw over the other guy right like oh you know passive liquidity we're gonna like disable jet liquidity and we're gonna we're gonna just give traders really bad execution all the time because then they're not gonna trade on you anymore. Right? You're going to lose that volume. And you can't say, like, you know, we're going to, um, uh, uh, you know, just have LPs get screwed um, and not, you know, and, and we're, just, we're only going to optimize for, for swapper. Um, uh, the swapper is always in every moment getting the best possible price, um, regardless of, what, of, how, of, of uh, whether it's informed or uninformed. Um, uh, because then you're, then you're going to uh, screw over potentially the passive LPs and you'll lose your liquidity. Um, mm -hmm. That's on chain. So I think you really need to solve both these problems at the same time. That's what we're trying to do with before. And um, and you know, swap backs, um, and you try to do it by taking money from basically who, who isn't in the room, who isn't in the system. Um, and I think the the, in, the uh, no offense, but it's you know it's, it's the word of it's the it's the informed flow that we're trying to we're trying to reduce their profit margins. Um, and uh, I think the uh, you know that, that's that's the hope with with V four is to be able to, to extract a little more of the of the optionality you're giving away. Um, although again, a lot of that actually ends up going to MEV anyway. So I think it isn't even going into winning these profit margins, right? A lot of that is ultimately going to, to Ethereum stakers actually anyway, um, because it, it gets competed away by other by competition among arbitrageurs. Um and then yeah, and then I think with with uh with Uniswap X, I think it's it is about trying to yeah, just give users the best the best price regardless of where it comes from. But yeah, TYM is, is one of the ways the, the ways I think uh uh, MCA and M is another where I think we're just trying to, to tilt the balance back in favor of passive liquidity being able to be competitive. Got it. Evgeny, any thoughts there? No, it's, it's just like it's really interesting. Like Uniswap Pax is to me much more interesting than the, like, the whole Cooks discussion because basically I think what Uniswap is trying to do is basically to capture the whole, like the whole space, like the whole, well, basically the whole, uh, how do you call it, vertical basically. Like, yeah, do MMs, do Cooks, yeah. do wallet do everything basically owns the whole thing and it is quite interesting how they like whether they will, they will succeed or not like there is definitely space for internet to be involved finally i would say uh on the maker side uh so that's like that's that's definitely going to be interesting but yeah it's kind of like yeah units will basically fight in the wallet wars rfq wars like mm wars like all in the same one uh yeah and let, let, let's let's see what happens i think the way i would put it i think i think there is there's the dex wars, and the dex wars are fought on a lot of different fronts. Yeah. Um, I think if we want to give you want to give users the best execution, and you want to give uh, passive liquidity providers um, uh, the best the best possible possible um, returns, um, you need to actually potentially just just think about this as a full system. Um, 
And and yeah, I think and Uniswap is you know we, I think we have we have some visions for how these this plays out in different layers of the stack. But it, it, it generally, just some of it, some of it comes from not being religious about about how it works and just thinking, okay, what, what's our end goal? And the end goal is how do we how do we get used to the best prices? How do we make this the best place, place to trade all this? And everything else kind of stems from that. Um, yeah, and wallets wallets are a, are a big place where people trade. I think it, it improves a lot of the of the user experience. I think RFQs are, are just going to be increasingly a place where we where we're going to have to squeeze out a couple more of those bips of X. Execution for for users is going to come from there, um, but I, I see it all as and then, and then MEV is a place is just the place where most of this value is leaked out of the system. So how do we try to minimize that? Um, and I think that's it's all in service of um, how do we actually get the best prices for users. Cool. Last question, and then maybe Chow has one more question after that. Uh, is hooks? We have a, you know we're, we're obviously we obviously see a lot of startups that are building the space. You know we've seen many many iterations of AMMs, but. Obviously, no one has come close to what you guys have built. Uh, now it seems like Hooks is the next opportunity, hopefully for founders to build in space. And so I guess the question is, is the idea, you know, if you think of the analogy of like iPhone and the App Store, is that the same analogy we should be thinking about? That would be, that would be beyond my wildest dreams. Okay. Uh, it's successful. But I think, I think that's, that is absolutely the hope is that it can be something where people can build platforms on it. In fact, I would say... Um, yeah, I say beyond my wallet streams, but actually, I think the App Store actually fails on the um, the Bill Gates test of of a platform, yeah. which is is the total value of um, of what's built on top of it um, greater than the value of the of the platform itself, yeah. and that is true for Windows and not true for um, uh, for the iPhone. And so, I, I would I would actually say, like my my hope would be even to aspire further and say, could we actually get more more value built on top of Uniswap than than actually accrues to, to Uniswap to the base layer itself? Um, because I think that's really important. I think we haven't had that to date. Um, with the, you know, I think there's a lot of great stuff built on top of Uniswap uh, to date, but I think we haven't had the ability to really build um, a huge, you know, Dex, for example, on top of it, right? Like you can build a, you know, passive balance various strategies, but like what Uniswap before allows you to do is build a Dex, and you know, de- building a Dex is a good, is a good uh, if you can if you can make it really work, is a good business. Um, I think our hope would be that yeah, that you can absolutely build a um, uh, a competitive and really successful decks on top of Uniswap before. So I would love to see people um, uh, trying to do that. And I think we're, we're trying to be as supportive, really bend over backward in ways that we haven't always been. And I think I certainly haven't always been encouraging of, of competition. Um, I would necessarily must open. I think try, really trying to encourage as much as possible um, people to feel comfortable building on top of this. One final question. Uh, so aside from everything we talked about today, is there anything else in DeFi that you guys are really excited about? I'll just throw some buzzwords. Uh, fixed income, RWAs, options, you know, et cetera. Anything that you guys are excited about? Yeah. I think having, having decentralized prep trading, as we talked about before, is really uh, is important. Um, and I'm, I, we're also, also, we also invested in DRDX, and I was just very excited about that. really like that team. Um, I'm excited about it. But generally, uh, and sound, sound perps, I think, mm-hmm. I think better, better design for perps. Um, we've, we've done some work um, in NFT finance with, um, with Blur, which is another area that I'm fairly excited about. I think uh, to, to name another uh, trend, Oracle list uh, protocols, I think are, are very interesting. You know, I think it's, it, it can be a bit of a misnomer, but the general idea there is um, you can use these crypto economic mechanisms um, like we did with Blur on, on Blend uh, to try to replace Oracles um, uh, where otherwise, and, and when you, it's not just that you get rid of this Oracle dependency, it also opens up, I think, uh, the ability to, to go much longer tail than you would if you were depending on on something that uh, you know only be able to support things that are that are supported by by oracle providers um so i think that's an interesting trend in getting really long tail like with with um nft uh uh collateral as, as, as a big example um and then one more i think i do think uh it would be nice to have treasury returns on chain um, it's pretty funny because you, you do see these like cycles where when when interest rates were zero percent and DeFi uh, rates were like oh, I'll say five percent, but you know, some people thought they were twenty percent, but they were never twenty percent. Um, but when DeFi rates were high, uh, you know, you saw all these people trying to take DeFi yields off chain, and now we're like, oh, the, you know, DeFi yields are lower than than off chain yields. Let's try to get the off chain yields on chain. But um, I think Treasuries are a really good, uh, uh, just like MVP for um, real world assets, which is it just really makes sense that we should have like the risk free rate on chain um, and like. It, it, abstracts away a lot a lot of the problems we've had with real world assets before is you basically get with these like with these sketchy assets of uh, whoever's willing to go on chain and it's like all right if we're willing to actually let's just wrap like the least sketchy asset we can make of. although i don't know maybe it's maybe treasuries are not the least sketchy anymore uh, least sketchy asset other than, than ethereum um but uh 
if you, if you could if you can wrap these yields on chain, um, I think you can get a lot out of it, including what would be really nice would be a permissionless stable coin. I don't think you can get to permissionless, but uh, necessarily with uh, with treasuries, but um, it'd be really nice to have a, a stable coin design that works on chain, um, a, a more decentralized stable coin. Um, uh, yeah, that doesn't, that, you know, we're not going to get that with treasuries, but I think that's a, um, would be another, another kind of design um, that'd be very nice to see work. Evgeny? Well, I mean, I'm easily excitable in general, um, <laughs> but I think like the thing that would excite me the most, like if it can be solved, well, that should be solved eventually is just general like usability of DeFi for general populace, like basically being able to have a wallet and that not lose connection to it. I know all the account abstraction stuff, like basically making it much easier to onboard. Well, I mean, everyone keeps saying like, let's onboard next billion users. Like we cannot do it at the moment. Like it's just too tedious, too scary. Like we don't even have like a million users at the moment, honestly. So it's like once this design space is getting like solved and once probably it's going to be wallets that are at the forefront of that, like once they actually fix it for like average person to not be scared to sign transactions, not be scared to, I don't know, send their board aid somewhere. Um, yeah, I think that that would be the most exciting things that will actually happen to our space because then we'll actually see massive, massive adoption finally. And that, like, because currently my main challenge with seeing like a lot of those exciting protocols, are the delays, perps, options, like whatever, is we actually have no idea whether there is actual product market fit at all because the amount, number of users is ridiculously low. And it can very well be that all those like winners from this cycle, like when the real adoption comes, we'll actually see them losing because they actually did not optimize for, well, average, average Joe from the street, basically. Yeah. I, uh, Great. I was actually talking about this with uh, Imran the other day about how we think that the vast majority of incumbents today will be dethroned in a few years. Because today, the, the actual number of users in crypto is very, very small compared to the total number of humans. It's basically zero. So when all the humans come into our space, um, it, it's not inconceivable that, that the incumbents get dethroned by better and, and newer um, products. Great. Well, we're at time. Dan, Evgeny, thanks so much for your time. It was great talking to you guys and learning more about your thoughts on Uniswap before. Hey, yeah. right. Thanks for having us. That was a great chat. Learned a lot about you know, Uniswap before and what hooks can enable Uniswap X and how Evgeny was thinking about... It seems like Evgeny is actually interested in yes. participating in Uniswap before and... and um, sorry, in Uniswap X. Maybe no, even no, as a filler. Both, 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 actually. Both, yeah, both. Yeah. Which I thought was very interesting. I think the one thing he said was like, you know, being that gas is that low, it's a no brainer in regards to being able to at least participate on the arbitrage side. So yeah, yeah uh, like maybe we can uh, summarize all of this for our listeners. Yeah. So uh, I can mention a couple of details that yeah. uh, Evgeny said. Well, first of all, Wintermi does not participate in V3 as a maker. Yeah. They participate as a taker. And that exa exactly what we suspected before going into the interview. Yeah. that the flow is very toxic on V3 for makers, meaning the impermanent loss is positive for the makers, right? And, and that has to do with the way the AMMs are constructed. It doesn't provide enough flexibility, enough customizability for the market makers to build profitable strategies. But in V4, the hooks might enable that. And Evgeny seems pretty excited to try it out. So that's that's the first detail. Another detail is that well, actually, to confirm what, what uh, Evgeny said, Dan said something very interesting about the impermanent loss studies that, that people have, have done yeah. uh, about V3. It seems that uh, impermanent loss is actually, like, makers actually lose money over time on V3 on aggregate, especially in the big pairs. So by big pairs, we probably mean uh, the likes ETH. of ETH, USDT, yeah. right? Uh, rather than the long tail of shit coins. Um, so for those big pairs, the makers actually lose money. And even Dan said he's, he's not really sure why people still provide liquidity in Uniswap V3. And that is a really important point because in the long run, people will realize that they don't make money as a maker. And if that persists, the maker, the, 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 the LP liquidity will go down over time. But I mean, 
This is Uniswap has been launched since what three four years. I mean, people should have came to that realization already. Yeah, but it, it's possible that there's so much um, uninformed money that like it keeps getting it keeps getting uh, uh, recycled. So like you're a retail person, you're going to Uniswap V3 as a LP, you provide liquidity mm. for three months, you lose money, you withdraw. But then there's other people who who join who, without knowing this. Uh, so there's other people who join. So the liquidity is constantly getting recycled. Um, well, but let's play devil's advocate. Well, not, I wouldn't say devil's advocate, but you know, maybe, uh, something that we're seeing with hooks, right? Is the idea with hooks to return some of the profits back to the makers? An example that, that we talked about, uh, with Dan was the idea that you could build a, a hook that enables trading or traders or arbitrageurs to pay a fee to get access to the, the arbitrage opportunity per block. Because right now there's a free riders problem. And the free riders problem today is the fact that since the the maker side, so far arbitragers are able to get a free option to be able to arbitrage away the profits against a, a sex, right? Or mm-hmm. a centralized exchange. And because of that, there's that impermanent loss that, that makers feel every time. Mm-hmm. And so what he wants to do is create a hook that enables these arbitrageurs to pay a fee back to the maker in order for them to get that options, free options, right? So that mm-hmm. way they can arbitrage that opportunity away. And that rent that is being paid per block would go to the maker side. And the question is, is this like, if you think about this specific opportunity, is this like a way to make makers whole again from the impermanent loss side? And if that's the case, could other hooks be enabled whereby whatever strategy that they create a part of that fee goes back to the maker side to make them whole. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how, how things will play out, but there are many ways, at least on centralized exchanges, to make the maker whole. And the ways yeah. to make the make, the, yeah. to enable these ways to make the, the maker whole, you need enough flexibility and customizability. And that's exactly the advantage of order books yeah. compared to AMMs, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so hopefully, hooks do, do provide enough flexibility to enable these ways to, to make uh, makers whole. So here's another detail that, that um, Evgeny mentioned. Many times on V3, he wants to pull liquidity and he can't either because it's too late or mm-hmm. because it's too expensive to withdraw. Mm-hmm. And I know this from personal experience because I've done market making in the past mm-hmm. that when to withdraw your liquidity is the single most important and difficult decision to make as a liquidity provider. And if V3 doesn't give you enough flexibility to do that, then it's never going to work for professional market makers. And it feels like, at least according to, to Evgeny, V3, V4 is something that can enable you to uh, build sophisticated strategies to withdraw your liquidity at the right time. So that, yeah. that's the most important thing about market making. So a lot of it just seems like you know gas improvements that will enable more and more professional market makers to to come onto the space, it, right? It's gas improvement and also the flexibility that, that hosts provide. Yeah. It's a combination. And this is enabled because, you know, when you have singleton contracts where all the contracts are on a singular smart contract versus several, and then also they enable flash accounting. So instead of being able to transfer tokens internally, they just have this like simple accounting system that's put into place that kind of takes into action where these tokens should go, but then disperse the tokens at the end as if uh, where the, the token should go. Between the singleton, between flash accounting, and then the hook architecture, which is, you know, before they would have oracles or the price accumulators per block, now they're sourcing that out to hooks. I think between these three, I think there, there's a huge improvement on the gas side that makes it much more opportunistic for market makers like Wintermute to join and start to become more professionalized. Yeah, and related to to this whole discussion of toxicity for makers, so we actually also talked talked about Uniswap X, which is actually really related to to V four. The, the two yes. are, are, are related. We'll talk about why. But um, Uniswap X, as we suspected, um, feels uh, directly competitive to CalSwap and very similar to this de- uh, in design to mm-hmm. One Inch um, Fusion, where basically when the taker or, or a trader uh, signs a transaction, a no fee transaction uh, about their intent to trade. Uh, there is what they call fillers. Other people use the word um, 
what's the, what's the other word that, that they use in, in Anoma? Solvers. Solvers, Solvers. that's right. Yeah. And uh, also one inch used the word resolvers. So it, I think they all mean the same thing. So these are basically professional market ma makers that take the other side of the, the trade of the, of the trader, of the taker off chain. And then they decide, um, how they want to uh, internalize the flow. The problem with this architecture is that basically the fillers or the solvers, they have a first look into the trading flow and they can decide whether or not they want to take the flow. And normally a good solver uh, or filler, uh, by good, I mean economically um, rational solver yeah. or, 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 uh, or filler, will take the flow only if they think that it's profitable to do so. So they will take, they will be on the other side of all the uninformed flow. And that will leave the informed flow passed by them, which ultimately gets settled on chain in the Uniswap uh, AMM or V4. So, so this is where V4 and Uniswap X are related. So the, 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 let me finish. The, the, the result of that is that because you have these fillers like Wintermute and others that are very sophisticated and they have first look on the trading flow, that means that the flow that ends up getting settled on chain is extremely, extremely toxic for the Uniswap LPs. They are already very toxic in V3. But imagine V4 with Uniswap X. Mm -hmm. It means that the LPs in Uniswap, w w the flow that they're getting is extremely toxic. So I think that Uniswap LPs will lose even more money with mm. Uniswap X. And, and that, that's the conundrum that, that I, that, that Uniswap is facing that, that Dan and, mm. and, you know, Hayden are, are facing. Interesting. Um, I thought it was going to be the other way around where the toxic flow would go, out, would be outsourced elsewhere. Well, so where do you think they will be outsourced? Um, I mean, it could be outsourced through other exchanges, right? Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, it and, could. So, so the toxic yeah. flow, uh, again, the fillers yeah, because, and solvers, they have first look at the flow. So they will get the best flow for them. Right. So whatever that's left over is more toxic yeah. than it was. And that flow could end up on centralized exchanges. It could also end up on, um, on the Uniswap AMM. Yeah, it can. Um, I, I just don't know how much of it is going to go to the LPs of, of Uniswap versus exchanges. Correct. But on average, it should be more toxic than it used to be, be without Uniswap X. What, like, but why? Because, because you have the fillers that, that get the first look. So the fillers get the first look and they're okay. And then they see the disparity in price, let's say on Uniswap, and then they trade against that because they get a better price arbitrage opportunity on Uniswap. Is yes. that the idea? Yes. And, and then, so again, the, 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 the intuition behind this is that um, the fillers are very sophisticated. They will only trade against the flow that is dumb and uninformed. Yep. Yep. So on average, they will make money. And what that means is, on average, um, whatever flow that they don't trade against um, is very toxic. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. So this means that if what you're saying is true, this means that um, LPs that are providing liquidity for Uniswap are going to hurt even more. Yes. Th there's an analogy from uh, TradFi for those who, uh, who are familiar with how Citadel and others work. So the, the payment for order flow. Um, basically, you as a retail trader, so Imran, let's say you trade on uh, Charles Schwab yeah. or Fidelity. Yeah. Um, well, you're not uninformed flow, but the average retail is uninformed. The average retail loses money. But Cit the likes of Citadel and, and others, they get the first look yeah. into your flow. So they can trade against you, the retail. Yeah. And they will trade against whatever flow where they can make money on, leaving the rest to settle on exchanges like NASDAQ and NYSE, et cetera. And the leftover flow is bad for Citadel, would be bad for Citadel. And therefore, they would, they would be bad for the market makers on NASDAQ and NYSE. Yeah. But Citadel doesn't want that. And Citadel has the option to not want that because they, they get the first look. So it's the exact same analogy here. Interesting. Uh, I'd love to see this play out. Um, if you think about, uh, okay, so that's one, right? The other element is um, Dan mentioned is cross chain, also. Yep. Uh, where you know, in theory, you know, by having you know, you have rollups as a service, right? And you have liquidity on all of these rollups as a service. And the idea here is, you know, now it's very easy to just you know 
trade on Uniswap X by providing what you're looking for. And then you have the fillers that will then source the liquidity f- between chains mm-hmm. to provide the, the, the assets for the trade. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like there's a lot of M- MEV that could be captured uh, in that flow as well, right? And we've never really talked about cross-chain MEV. But that MEV, in my mind, basically goes to the fillers. Yep, yeah. Because and they I can search look, yeah. and they can do arbitrage, uh, or whatever other s- statistical um, uh, arbitrage that, that, that they can build. Yep. Um, leaving the most toxic flow to on-chain. Um, and I also think, like, uh, if you th- if you look at, um, I, I I've done many cross chain trades, and the spreads are horrible. It's just horrible. Like, there's just no way it's like you're better off just buying the tokens on Coinbase and sending it to the wallet of your choice. Yeah, there's just there's just no way. Uh, yeah. Spreads are too high. The best I've seen in terms of spreads is like Axelar. They've done pretty good. Um, yeah. But outside of that, it's it, it's very hard to get the right spreads. So I would assume in this case. Um, a lot of the fillers will source liquidity from probably um, exchanges here. Centralized exchanges, that's right. Centralized exchanges. Yeah. Uh, and so maybe there will be some MEV that will be captured from that. But, uh, you know, even from the spreads perspective, I think it's just going to be much better to uh, to trade against that from using Yeah, we'll say it, it'll XLR. depend on whether or not Uniswap X can attract the best market makers. Yeah. <clears throat> because the spread that you're getting as a retail is basically a function of that. The, yeah. the more professional market makers there is in the in the whole network, the tighter the spread and the better price you get as a retail. Okay, so let, let's talk about this a bit more because right now, if you look at Matcha, Matcha has an RFQ system. And with this RFQ system, they have a whole on-chain, uh, off-chain uh, RFQ system where they have market makers that get the flow and then they provide the liquidity for that flow, right? Yep. Um, that's kind of how it works. And so it is... Yep. Like an intent-based architecture, right? To a certain yes. degree. Yes. Um, and uh, one inch does this with fusion. So how much of a how much competition do you think this is gonna put pressure on for both Matcha and One Inch and, and Cowswap to that degree? It seems to me that it's directly competitive. Yeah. Um and if if it's directly competitive, um this could mean that Matcha and One Inch and others will have to do a lot more here to stay competitive. Otherwise, their margins are going to get eaten alive. That's right. Uh, so I guess the question I'm asking here is like, what is the f- evolution of the aggregation layer going to look like over the next six to 12 months? Um, and I'm pointing to the wallet, you know, swap wallet that has launched. Then you have the aggregation layer. And then now you have the liquidity layer. Yep. So it seems like, <laughs> you know, swap is going after every layer and they're doing this purposefully right before, let's say if we do get a bull market, Right before the bull market, this is I think being you're, launched. You're exactly right. So Uniswap is fighting every single one of their competitors on every single front. Yeah. At, at the at the aggregator layer, layer at the wallet layer, and at the liquidity layer. Yeah. Every sing- and by the way, one inch was only at the aggregation layer. Yep. Um, they tried. They tried the AMM layer, and and I I think they failed. Did they? Did they try it? They did. They had a, they they launched their AMM pools uh, a year and a half ago. Okay. Um, and uh, I wouldn't call it a failure, but um, you know, it was very hard to get liquidity on some of the pools that they had. So I, I still think they have some pools, but it's not nowhere near uh, Uniswap's like breadth and depth of liquidity. Yeah. Matcha, uh, they they're just purely an aggregator layer. They're that's where they're staying. Yeah. Um, and they're doing, you know, gasless swaps and making it, you know, their focus is primarily on price and the best execution is their focus. Yeah. So the question then is, um, what this, what would this evolution look like? Meaning like, will Uniswap just completely cannibalize one inch? Will Uniswap completely cannibalize matcha? Um, being that there's only 40, 50 million active users of which maybe 10% use, you know, aggregators, 15% use aggregators, whatever it is. Would this mean with the launch of wallets that all new flow that comes into the crypto space will be owned by Uniswap and therefore Matcha and One Inch would be left? The point being, um, Uniswap is fighting their competitors on multiple fronts with yep. the launch of wallets, but also recently uh, Uniswap X and uh, the AMM V4. Yep. So we'll see what happens. Uh, 
to Uniswap V4, Uniswap X uh, in the upcoming bull run. But uh, for founders that are looking to build in a space, um, if you're looking to build hooks around the hook architecture, feel free to DM us. would be interested in learning more about the types of implementations you're looking at. Uh, Chow, any final thoughts? Nothing in particular. It just feels really difficult for startups in DeFi to try to compete with incumbents when they don't have the distribution. The incumbents are not only fighting each other, but also stealing, well, not stealing, but taking the, the innovation from startups and, and shove it into their existing distribution. So, so really hard. It's very hard. But there, there is some glimmer, right? You know, if you look at like Pendle and tokenized yield, yep. they're making a, a comeback, which is very exciting to see. Yeah. Uh, and we're seeing some on the liquid staking side. I don't know how much of it's going to grow, but it's also some interesting things. I don't know what could be taken away from them from Uniswap and like Ave and others, but uh, it's de- de- definitely an area that we're watching. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks for listening. And, um, We'll catch you next time. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to Good Game. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you next week.